reaching large numbers of practicing and training professionals and I will go into that in a little bit more in my talk. But I've already introduced myself that I'm a doctor, um, educator but also an ME-CFS patient. And following the last CMRC meeting, I did have a bit of a crash for about two months and then was put on the Oseltamivir, which is a Tamiflu, which gave me a significant increase in my energy and I was able to get about 30 hours a week instead of about eight hours a week. So it was a massive difference. Um, and I'm now still working three days a week, which is two full days of work split across. I do Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday, just so I can pace my energy through the week. So I work as a dermatology surgeon and I cut out skin cancer, but I've always been interested in education and research. And I'm really pleased to be using my experiences in education and research and my contacts with the Royal Colleges to uh, promote um, education and information on MECFS at a wider level. So I've been attending conferences, meetings, charities, um, and last week I was at the All Nations Centre in Wales lecturing to 50 GPs on the topic. It went down very well. In fact, they was overbooked with a waiting list and now they want to book it for 150 and run it again. So doctors do want to know more about this. It's becoming interesting. It's gone from the vague biopsychosocial model to a really interesting scientific conundrum. And it's actually starting to hook the interest of some of the doctors, particularly those who have patients who they don't know what to do with. I couldn't have done it all without the support of my parents who've been amazing throughout and in fact nursed me through my worst days. <clears throat> and also my family who are also <laughs> extremely supportive of my situation. So, second part, medical school research. This is something I introduced at the last talk and I talked about the pilot trial I was going to do and I'd got the green light on doing a survey around the medical schools across the UK from the Medical Schools Council. And we did, we worked together and we sent out a questionnaire to 34 medical schools up and down the UK, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And we had a very good response rate um, compared to uh, a study that was in, done in the US where they had around 50%, we felt very uh, pleased to get about two thirds of the UK medical schools to respond. And of those total 22 respondents, about half are teaching MECFS, but only three are spending more than two hours on the topic and only two think that a, pa a, a student will meet a patient in their five to six years of studying um, <laughs> at medical school and only five are asking exam questions on the topic. So there is still a long way to go and I think the Medical Schools Council were very pleased that we identified this patient participation part of it because that's something that's going across the board. They're even getting patients in to interview potential future doctors because they think that the patient voice is important. The specialists teaching MECFS were quite varied. We had paediatricians, ophthalmologists, um, but also quite a lot of psychiatrists are still teaching on this topic. Um, and unfortunately, despite the fact that 22 medical schools back, got back to us, not a single one wanted to tell us what they're actually teaching. Nobody shared any lecture notes, slides or handouts on the topic. And from a previous Freedom of Information study, one can only imagine that they're teaching that it's functional, medically unexplained and very vague. On a very positive note, the medical schools were really keen on seeing further resources to help them to teach this topic. They don't have in-house specialists or experts, but they are willing to take on e-learning modules. The videos were the most popular, with 10 universities getting back to say they'd accept a video on this. Um, and the other thing that kept coming back time and time again is, can we get some patients here to talk about their experience of the illness to our students? 
I also ran four student projects and I've got one of my students here today, she's speaking this afternoon, she's got a poster, and I've got another person who supervised our um, student projects as well. So Esme and Millie, if you just give everyone a wave. <laughs> So I'd like you to make sure to see posters A1 and A5 because that's part of the work that's come out of the research that I've been doing with medical students at medical schools um, in the UK. And what we asked the students was to, do, to design for themselves some small scale projects uh, where they drew on the patient voice to make judgments about education, primary care, quality of life and care services. <coughs> In education, patients got back to uh, 38 patients um, got back to our student with information about what they thought doctors should learn. In primary care, this was about what kind of care patients would like from their GP. And across the board, patients wanted an early and accurate diagnosis. In terms of quality of services, and that's the presentation for this quality of life, that's the presentation for this afternoon, we did a brand new study on the impact of the quality of life of family members of those with ME. And we found that it's significantly greater than any other disease or cancer. So the tallest bar here shows that there's a bigger impact on the quality of life of your family member if you have ME. And finally, uh, sort of an NHS outcomes, um, waiting times for diagnosis of 97 patients who responded to our questionnaire in Wales was nine years on average, um, which was shocking and patients didn't really feel very well supported once they did actually then see the care service about where to go next with their health. So having drawn on all of that um, information, there were quite a lot of learning points about how to involve patients and carers. To begin with, we thought about workshops, but the patients weren't too well to come. 60 patients actually stood forward and said, we'd love to be interviewed on this. But when it came to the six week time frame for the students to run their project, only 23 were well enough. Three patients actually did inter semi-structured interviews by email because they found it easier to get someone to help them answer questions by email. And in general, there are a lot of logistical issues um, and we had to make sure that the patient information that we'd got um, ethics approval on was in different typefaces and the opportunity to have it read over the phone. <coughs> so in summary, the experience from the projects that I initiated before the last meeting shows that patient involvement is key. It was really pleasing that the Medical Schools Council have got on board with us and in fact one of the representatives came to a Ford ME meeting at the House of Lords. Uh, universities are keen on receiving videos and e-learning. We've already um, put forward an abstract for the Association of Medical Educators Conference this summer, assuming it goes ahead because of the coronavirus. Um, but this is uh, all the top um, undergraduate deans and policy makers and <coughs> curriculum writers, and they will be there, and I'm hoping to put Emmy uh, on their um, agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and then the plan is to engage more medical educators through initiatives like that and publish, obviously, our work. So, Medical Education Group. We have been meeting um, quarterly. Our role is to enhance the understanding of ME within the health profession and educate healthcare practitioners and trainees. Our focus is on communicating the latest ME-CFS biomedical research and the needs of MECF patients and their carers. The accountability is obviously to the CMRC Executive Board um, and membership is f for us to have a meeting to curate. Uh, we have at least three of the following medical professional, at least one member of the CMRC Board, a lay member, a member of the patient advisory group, 
Um, and you've already put your hands up, but that's what I was hoping to really get to mention how much work you have been doing to support me in that. And I really thank you for that. Um, and also a charity representative. And Sam has been on pretty much all of those calls and, and Russell as well. So that's been fabulous to see. Um, so we're, what are we chatting about in those meetings? We try and keep it to, to an hour. And we also try and give um, patients a break halfway through. And I think that's really helping. Just re remembering that we have ill people on the line and that everything we do has to be moderated to make sure to consider the abilities of, of everyone there. So we've been talking about our terms of reference, who our stakeholders are, and how we might create better subgroups. That might be nurses, physios, GPs uh, and medical educators. Uh, we've supported the stand and we had 65 GPs sign up to show interest um, in MECFS at the CMR, at the GP conference last summer and we will be following that up with further questionnaires and information collection. Um, we've also been making contact with medical educators and I think this is where we really need to start engaging better with our colleagues in Canada, Australia uh, and the States and learning collaboratively about what education is working. I would love to know more about how you're teaching the CCC criteria to, to doctors um, and really actually putting our heads together. In a way, the education has been quite stalled in the UK because of the nice guidelines not coming out until December. And what we really need to do is, is learn from um, your experience of uh, releasing online training materials and perhaps tailor ours to a UK audience and a UK healthcare setting, but also um, tailor it to, to be ready for, for the new NICE guidelines. Um, and that brings us on to, to how we might um, roll out a, a 2021 20, national health campaign. So lots of ideas, lots of really positive meetings, lots of people coming together. I mean, in our last meeting, we had someone from Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, Wales. We, we've had educators, we've had <coughs> patients, we've had professionals. And I, I really do feel as though, as a, gr as a working group, we are making progress. Um, the events that we've organised are across Buckinghamshire, Cardiff, Bristol, Cambridge and hopefully London. Um, again, we're just watching that space on the, uh, on the coronavirus. Um, again, last time, I keep coming back to the, the, the groundwork that I laid on the last occasion. Anecdotally and from literature, we knew that there is a problem with our doctors diagnosing this in patients. And we also know from a scientific basis, there's this gap in that 10 minute consultation, a patient can appear quite normal. But over time, this is what the doctor sees, but over time, patients get worse and worse at their cognitive ability. This is just on maths questions, but it can be anything really where they have to concentrate. And that gap is something the patient knows about, but cannot always explain to their doctor so often, getting to an appointment can involve multiple days of planning, weeks afterwards of resting, it can involve someone taking them, it can involve them feeling ill before or afterwards, but usually during the consultation, the patient is so desperate to get their point across, they can almost seem to be catastrophizing how they feel. And if they come with a relative, the relative is often fussing them because they know how sick that patient is. But the doctor, seeing that small, tiny um, thing unfolding, is looking at the relative and thinking, well, you're sort of overreacting, you're creating this illness <laughs> ideal. Um, and there is a major problem with just seeing a small snapshot of how well the patient is. So along with um, some of the work that we did with the uh, medical education group and um, Dr. Hang, who is based up in near and uh, 
Ria Sonu, who's also in, in healthcare, uh, we've devised an online um, pre-assessment form and Olivia is one of our students at um, Cambridge who's also helped. And we've been asking doctors questions about what their current understanding is. And I also ran a little basic questionnaire to GP trainees and to practicing professionals in medicine. What do you think about the condition? What are the diagnostic criteria? What investigations would you do? It was actually to aid um, the teaching session that I was doing. Ideally, when you teach, you want to find out where the knowledge gaps are, target them, and then retest afterwards to see if your teaching has been successful. Um, GP thoughts on ME, well, they were quite vague. Not everybody agreed. Um, and there was a, a lot of sticking on this co diagnosis of exclusion. You've got to get everything else excluded. You've got to test for this or that and make sure you're not missing cancer. And because they were so stuck on this diagnosis of exclusion, the problem then becomes, once they've diagnosed it, it, it must be exclusive because they assume that the patient has gone through all those other tests to make sure they don't have anything else. Um, and I think we need to come away from that in our teaching and go more towards um, some of the scientific research criteria for diagnosis. Some, some doctors think it's functional, are, are unpredictable. Uh, it tends to be the heart sink patient that they don't really know what to do with. The GP answers to the online questions was even more interesting. 71% um, had no prior teaching on the topic. Nearly 40% think, think it's psychological or psychosomatic. We actually put this in the questionnaire, psychological slash psychosomatic, to make sure we weren't missing um, the details of, of where the, the doctors actually put the illness. Um, and there is a bit of a difference. So psychological problems can be anxiety and depression, whereas psychosomatic can, can be that you, your leg has fallen off and, and well, you think your leg has fallen off, but it's actually still there. Uh, <laughs> only 11% were either confident about diagnosing or confident about managing patients. And nearly one in five doctors don't think that ME affects children, which actually goes quite well with the big data in that only 7% of children are diagnosed within their time frame because doctors aren't looking for it in children. 91.7% um, think that patients need to build up their strength from exercise and a shocking 41.7% think that children with ME miss school because their parents support the sick role and that this should be discouraged and potentially it's their role to do, to do that, which is really concerning. There we go, promised you. <laughs> so the, in, in teaching the topic, the, the bit that we're interested in teaching doctors is how to hone in on the orange bullseye there. Um, and from a personal point of view, I find the IOM diagnostic criteria the easiest to teach because it's got just the, the four main diagnostic criteria. And so this is what I am using in, in my lectures to doctors and GPs, including Natalie's video and the link there, um, along with post-exertional malaise, and that's the six minute version. Um, and I think it's incredibly helpful for them to see that as part of a teaching package and backed up by uh, a, an actual tutor teaching them and or um, delivery of the information in a, a very easy, understandable way. When I asked the pre-questionnaire, uh, the very basic one that I designed, I expected roughly half of doctors to know at least some of those criteria, but in fact um, of a total of 32, around 10% were getting some sort of answer on, on mentioning these diagnostic criteria. There were a lot of not-sures or 
oh, I think it's exclusion or there's some pain or uh, very vague. Doctors really don't have a grasp of their diagnostic criteria. And they're also very centered around the main treatments of CBT and GET. And if these aren't going to be in the future guidelines, that this leaves a big void of understanding and where we're going to go uh, with what to tell doctors to tell patients they need to be doing. Um, so the relevance of what I've been doing to biomedical research and recruitment is summarized on this slide. I hope you can see it. Um, Many researchers appeal to clinicians to help recruit patients across the board in, in general medical problems. Um, and diagnostic rates are usually much higher in other illnesses and diseases compared to ME-CFS. So we are in this unique position in that we're trying to research an illness that doctors can't diagnose. Anecdotally, patients are better than clinicians at recognizing ME-CFS. And actually, from the information that I've gathered, self-diagnosed patients who meet the criteria, either CCC or IOM, may be actually a more accurate research group than those diagnosed by their GP. And for, for clinician involvement in recruitment into research to be of use, there would need to be a large-scale re-education of professionals on MECFS and or um, someone at the end of a telemedicine who is a specialist who can sort out whether someone has been misdiagnosed or not. Patient priorities for education are to remove these psychological and psychosomatic um, models. They want to know more about the immune, neurologic, endocrine, genetic and metabo metabolic explanations. Um, danger of the current treatment guidelines and or the importance uh, of pacing is something that patients really want doctors to know about. Fatigue is a real underestimate of how crippling the absolute exhaustion really does feel. You can barely digest your food. You can't even communicate. Fatigue doesn't even touch upon how bad it really is for patients and patients really want to get that message across too. There is an increased risk of suicide because it's such a big miserable illness to live with and impact on personal and carers and family members quality of life is also important to communicate. GPs want answers quick, they've got 10 minute consultations, they want to know what the latest evidence is on beta blockers because so many of them are tachycardic when they walk in. They want to know about steroids because of the neuroinflammation, mindfulness. They, they just want practical answers as to what can help them get through that 10 minutes with the patient. And until we have the infrastructure and specialists to support them, we're going to have to come up with some frameworks to help. So in summary, the challenge is that practicing professionals are not up to date with the new biomedical bio narrative and there is a certain amount of unpicking to do of the poor knowledge. So a lot of doctors are actually saying, well, isn't it a combination of depression? And so they're actually picking up quite a lot of depressed people and saying it's ME or they're telling people with ME they're depressed and there's a lot of that going on and it makes for a very poor research sample. Students and allied professionals also need education, educating and that has implications for recruitment to biomedical research. Um, I think we're doing a good job. We've gone a long way in 18 months um, and I have a lot to thank my PAG um, team and the rest of the medical education group for that. But I think we could be better. We need to communicate our teaching events more widely. Uh, we need to get nurses on the sort of group and all communicating with the medical education group. The PAG is excellent at, ed at communicating with the medical education group, but we need to get cross communication with all the other groups and also with international colleagues. 
Um, this morning over breakfast it was, this is the time for ME. In the post-coronavirus world, as we all recover, I think that we should be looking at how we can really solve this as our next big challenge. So thank you to everyone. <laughs>